are um, lucky <laughs> to have Ron uh, stay with us to moderate this panel. Uh, as he spoke about, he spent a long uh, period in the Congress uh, working kind of with, uh, um, <laughs> well, he was uh, the chief uh, staff member at the Ways and Means in the House, and so had lots of experience to give about um, how our legislators were using evidence or not, and a lot of that he shared earlier. Sasha Roscoe is the Director of Prevention and Early Intervention at the Department of Family and Protective Services. I would hate, and you even have like another name in your title too, right? I mean, another I think that's contracting. It. So, <laughs> no, no, so that's she her, there's, you know, gets paid by the letter, I think. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> she has um, a long history of working at the state level and understanding um, the, uh, how the state aims to implement programs that are effective and efficient and, and oversees lots of different programs currently um, in PEI. Matt Curry uh, is the founder and CEO of Green Lights. Uh, Green Lights is a um, nonprofit consulting organization. I mean, it's a nonprofit organization itself, but it really provides support and guidance um, and the backbone for a lot of nonprofits in Austin. It um, is engaged in kind of the collective impact that uh, working together can make. I'll let him speak a lot more about what he does. Um, and Carolyn Haney is the founder and executive director of We Viva, which is an organization that now has 19 sites across Austin that focuses on nutrition and wellness um, for w uh, disadvantaged women, low-income women. And um, so we are uh, really lucky to have all of you. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, I'm excited to hear your discussion. OK, good. Thank you very much. So we thought it would be a good idea to start We'd like to know, at least I would, and I think many of you would, a little more about what you actually do, uh, and then how, if at all, evidence actually plays a role in that. Now, let me make a little statement in the beginning, which is I'm always a little bit unnerved by practitioners. My, my, my experience over the years is the BS stops with the practitioners. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Scholars lie to each other all the time. Oh, we can do this and that, and the program does this and that, and policymakers you can never trust. And then you get practitioners there who run programs and know what it's like out there in the countryside, and they tend to be extremely honest and say, no, this doesn't work or this works. They're, they might not be totally honest about their own program. Come on, let's face that. But, but they are, this is where the rubber hits the road. So this is a great idea to have this panel. And that, that's the perspective that I hope you will give. My book is you know, scholarly based on interviews with congressional staffers and so forth. I want to know now, is it really having an impact in the countryside? Do you see evidence that, uh, uh, that evidence is having an impact? So please start each of you, take maybe five minutes or so, and tell us what you do and the extent to which evidence plays a role in it. We'll start with Sa Sasha. Yes. Um, well, good midday, wherever we are. Um, uh, we, in the Prevention Early Intervention Division, is a funder it, for the most part. Um, we have a budget right now, $44 million a year. We are poised to receive an additional $16 million in this current legislative session, so we are having a historic amount of growth, which is very exciting. Um, and within that, this, this wave of support for prevention, um, and for us, it's primarily for child abuse and neglect prevention, but we all know that all of these supports and protective factors sort of have you know, rippling effects on school readiness and, and other types of, of outcomes we're trying to avoid. Um, but within this wave of support and expansion, which is very exciting, certainly evidence-based practice has a huge theme. I, I, I get asked that by, by senators and representatives in committee hearings all the time. Well, are these programs evidence-based? Will they be evidence-based? Um, right now, they're sort of very satisfied with a very shallow answer, I'm gonna be very honest, which is, Yes, and then that's it. You know, I mean, so, um, uh, so it's easy enough to move along. Um, we have a statute that requires us to use evidence-based funding if funding is available. So we have, a, we have some wiggle room. We do not have anything terribly prescriptive about defining what an evidence-based program is um, or the level of evidence we have to mo monitor for. 
So the spirit is there. People want to fund what works. People want to see evidence that it is working. Um, we still have room, I think, to sort of define that narrative and, and define that, that amount of evidence and how much of it is purchasing a model from a developer and sort of that off-the-shelf magic bullet idea and how much of it is us bringing back evidence ourselves using bigger data. So that's where we are. Good. Matt. Great. Uh, so uh, I lead an organization called Greenlights, and we're, we're neither a direct service provider nor um, in, in the academic or in the government world. I don't know if that makes us more or less trustworthy in your book or not, but we, <laughs> we, live, where, we live, I think, where the action is. And I think if you, if, if you really get to the brass tacks of where uh, human interventions and social interventions that you're all talking about today actually happen, most of them don't happen in government, right? They don't happen in the private sector. They happen with nonprofits. Here in Central Texas, we have about 6,000 nonprofit organizations. We serve all of them in some form or fashion uh, in, a, in a meta way and in a strengthening way. And evidence and outcomes and evaluation and measurement are uh, always in the top two or three themes of the things that organizations are, are struggling with. Uh, but when you, when you think about the makeup of where most of the work is done, of the roughly 6,000 nonprofit organizations in this sort of central Texas community, where I know a lot of you spend your time, uh, only 72% of, uh, of, of them have income, total annual income, of less than $100,000. And so you know, almost, almost three quarters, uh, less than 15% of those organizations have even one staff person. And so when you think about the vast amount of work that's going on, trying to even talk about evaluation and evidence and RCTs is just, it's just totally foreign, totally foreign. So there's a very narrow swath of organizations that are even able to have uh, funding, uh, resourcing to, to talk about these models. And so I struggle a little bit with the, the heavy push towards a very rigorous evidence-based standard uh, because that, that by definition, just is, is going to leave out the vast majority of organizations that are doing what I think is, is in most cases, really good work helping change people's lives. Whether it's good enough for governmental funding standards or for academic standards, uh, probably not. Uh, but I think there's this inherent tension and balance in, in our work and in the work of most organizations between innovation and, and evidence. Uh, I was uh, with the, the, the mayor, new mayor here in Austin uh, last, uh, God, this week, Monday, you know, talking about the importance of innovation and let's try stuff to solve our big community problems and if we fail, that's okay, we'll try something else. And just a very different uh, approach or view uh, versus sort of a very rigorous, studied, measured, uh, evidence-based uh, uh, model. Uh, and at the same time, I was at, at Capitol yesterday talking, uh, testifying for a bill in front of the legislature that uh, uh, aims at promoting um, uh, pay for success initiatives, uh, or what are sometimes mislabeled social impact bonds. We think there's a lot of, of, of power in pay for success being an innovative uh, financing model for, for government and nonprofit and the private sector to come together to move uh, needles on our most complicated community problems. Uh, and, and certainly one of the questions that I got was, well, how do we know that these interventions you know, will work, such if we're going to put government money and, and contracts and, and risk out there, you know, how do we know it will work? And I gave a very shallow flip answer. Well, we hire you know, smart people in universities who, who can study and measure those things. And, you know, that sort of checked the box for him, and he voted yes, and that's, you know, that was, that was the depth of what he needed to know. You can find those smart people in universities? <laughs> uh, I, I know one or two. Yeah. yeah, one or two. So, I, you know, I guess my, my, my take on it, what I see, what work we do with foster care, work we do with health and education is having the standard out there is great, and I think wherever we can, we want to we continue to push organizations, uh, you know, towards evidence base. You know, sometimes that means let's just get a logic model in place. Let's just mm -hmm. talk about how you measure a couple of outcomes. It's baby steps. So I think the standard is good there, but if we over-apply it, uh, we're going we're gonna to stifle yeah. and, uh, and So Matt, let me, let me interrupt you for a minute because uh, this is fascinating. Um, uh, and I think you're probably right. I'll bet you a huge majority of the programs in the United States, especially the ones that are participating, some of you may remember one of the initiative of the Social Innovation Fund, 
which right. focuses exactly on these kind of organizations, yeah. it's possible that they are never going to get to the point where they have the talent, the staff, the time, the money to do any kind of serious evaluation. Right. So let me ask you this. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with the fact that they would never get there? Yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think there's great work being done. Yeah. I, mean, I do too. I, I think that there, so here's what I would think. Tell me if you agree with this. That there is, there will always, and they're falling apart and being recreated all the time. It's right. a, you know, there's tremendous dynamism out there, right. like in our economy, that things fail all the time and something else takes its place. So we will always have that set of, uh, of programs that are smallish and not well evaluated and sure. they'll make all kinds of claims right. and we'll have no idea if they're right or not. Right. I think that's a, we should encourage that and when they get to the point that they, because some of them do grow quite a bit and they, some of them get right. to be very, very large and even get government money and so forth. Right. So we should, we should have kind of like a conveyor belt. As long as they're small, struggling, mm -hmm. we leave them alone. Well, but I, when they get bigger, so. yeah. then we can what do you think of that? I don't know that I'd, I mean, well, I still think we need to push or, all organizations, all interventions toward, towards outcomes measurement and towards being able to prove it. And here's the reason, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an economist by training, and so uh, when I look at the nonprofit sector as compared to the private sector, in, in nonprofit, it's, it's very easy to start and to perpetuate a nonprofit organization, and, and it's easy to perpetuate frankly, a, a poor performing nonprofit organization. There just aren't the same market forces in place that drive a bad business out of business, right? Profit, you know, is a clear indicator of success. We don't have that elegant measure of success in the nonprofit sector that you do in the business world, and so we have to find proxies for that. We have to measure outcomes. We have to inform funders uh, and, and ensure that, that organizations that are not doing well know it, first of all, uh, and are held accountable to it, and either go out of business or are forced to change their, their ways so that the resources that we're all investing, whether it's through taxpayer dollars or through philanthropic dollars, are, are being put to good use. So I still think there's a standard of excellence, there's a standard of outcomes and measurement and impact that, that has to be there. Uh, I, just don't, I just know that if we set it at this very high sort of ivory tower evidence-based, randomized control tower, just the expense alone, the hurdles alone for the vast majority of great interventions out there, it, it's just not going to, it's not going to work. Okay. Carolyn. Thanks, um, and I so appreciate what you're saying, Matt. Um, so I am Carolyn Taney. I'm the founder and executive director of We Viva. It is a small nonprofit here in Austin, 501c3. Um, we started only in 2011, so only about four years ago, a budget of about $25,000 from a a small funder, um, and now our budget's about 300000 So we've grown exponentially, um, and our mission is to provide affordable and accessible fitness and nutrition programs. We do target um, adults, specifically moms. Uh, we feel as though moms can really be a change agent in their family, in the school that their kids go to, in the entire community, and so by targeting that mom with health and wellness and obesity, um, and all chronic diseases, really, we can really then impact the entire family. Uh, that's kind of our, our goal, and that's really the direction that we're going. Um, that means that we're doing a little bit more innovation than, than collecting evidence. Um, and I appreciate what you said when there's really, you know, there's innovators, and then there's people who are collecting evidence. And I think we're trying to do something a little bit against the, the, normal, the normal grain. I mean, there are tons of nonprofits that do um, childhood obesity prevention, and I'm a mom, and, and it's very important that my kids get that information at school and in after-school programs, but if they come home to me um, and you know I'm not informed of, of what's healthy and how to get myself healthy and how to do self-help and um, you know just information to me and education to me, I'm not going to be able to complement everything that they're learning in school. I'm going to be too tired. I'm going to give them the Funyuns. I'm just going to say, you know, just, just stop crying or whatever it is. I can't handle it. Um, so I, I, as a mom, I think it's very important to, to target the, the caretakers in the house, whether it's the mom or the dad or the grandmother or, or whatever. Um, so a little bit about WeViva. We have um, 19 locations where we have classes right now. Um, we have about eight partner organizations where we have classes. So WeViva does not have 
a, a location, like we don't have a gym or anything. We go into apartment complexes, we go into churches, we go into schools, provide classes on site with childcare. When I started in 2011, I did, I did a little research um, and I went into an apartment complex um, underneath Foundation Communities and I asked the residents there, I said, look, if there was a fitness class in your apartment complex with childcare and was totally free for you, would you take it? Um, this was in January of 2011, and overwhelmingly, they said yes. Uh, we had 22 women start a six-week program, and after three classes a week, two fitness classes, one nutrition class, six weeks, 18 of those 22 women finished all 18 classes. So we really were onto something. We knew that there was a demand. Carol, we, let me just say something. People may not appreciate this. I, I've had a fair amount of experience with program evaluation, I can yes. tell you. The number one problem with intervention programs is they don't show up. Right. They don't right. come. The very famous right. Bush marriage initiative that got tons of attention, multi-million dollar evaluation, yep. big random assignment. Some of the sites, the participants got something like an average of 15% of the intervention. It's a huge achievement. It's I huge. want everybody and to know that. Thank you. And, um, and mm -hmm. I didn't give a little background personally. So I have my master's in social work um, from here. Go you too. Um, I moved here in 2003. You overcome that, we agree. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I moved here in 2003, um, got my master's in social work, and worked at two other nonprofits. Um, and so I started WeViva really with a, a social work perspective, which so much of social work is starting where the client is. So before I even asked them if they wanted fitness and nutrition, I said, what kind of fitness would you want? What kind of nutrition? Do you need someone who's Spanish speaking? Do you need childcare? So really asking the constituents what they need has been huge for WeViva. I mean, th that's why we're so different. We don't just, you know, I love to run and I love to bike, but the participants that we're trying to get engaged in fitness and nutrition don't like to run. They wanna do Zumba, they wanna do Latin dance, they wanna do something that's possibly foreign to me, but I can understand that that's what they want to make the health changes. So again, huge importance is asking participants what they want. Um, and just a, a quick, you know, a quick plug, we have 19 locations. We have over 300 people take a class a week. We have 35 locations all over Austin, or 35 classes all over Austin um, every day of the week. So from that one location in 2011, we've, we've grown just exponentially. Um, and we're working on our evidence base. <laughs> we're working on our results. Uh, we do a lot of participation information, like um, demographics. We do a lot of um, how many classes do you go to a week. Um, we ask some questions about how much um, is this trickling down to your kids? Are you cooking at home with your family? Kind of questions like that. Um, but we're working on it. If you had a measure of the mother, it's mostly mothers, right? Uh -huh, it's mostly if you had a measure of mothers, fitness of some, you know, a good, make, yes. do you think you would show that you've improved it? Absolutely. I mean, we have women who have lost 50 pounds. They take, of our 500, we have 500 spots basically a week, and of those 500, 300 people are, um, take one or more classes or two or more classes, so we call them repeat customers. So that is, you know, over 50% are taking more than one class a week. We have probably 100 women who take four or more classes a week, so these women possibly were never working out before. They didn't have the funds. They didn't have the access. They didn't have the childcare. And now that we've eliminated those barriers, it's like they're having fun. They're, you know, they're making relationships in our classes. It's not just about fitness. It's who are you working out with? You're holding that person accountable. You've got childcare taken care of. The person who's teaching you looks like you. We're not getting anyone who, who does CrossFit you know, to teach our classes. Everyone is <laughs> very culturally appropriate. Um, that's also very important, you know, is, is bringing a social work perspective and saying, we want to make this enjoyable and fun and culturally relevant um, to these communities. And so our locations in Southeast Austin look different than our locations in Northeast Austin. Our senior classes, we have, um, gosh, we have eight senior classes a week. Those look different than our, our young moms. Um, but seniors still need, need classes too, mm -hmm. so. Okay, let me ask you this. Um, we, were you all here for the first part of the? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I talked a lot about building this culture of, of evidence. And one part of the culture is gonna be dealing with failure. And I'm, you might be an exception since you run all your own programs, so of course none of them have failed. Uh, but we are about to enter 
uh, uh, period uh, in Obama evidence-based initiatives, and this will be apply to all programs at all times, that there will be a considerable amount of failure. We'll know it from good studies. And at that point, I've said, well, you know, we, we can't just say, oh, well, you're out of here because you failed. How, do you think that, do you have advice for how that should be handled? Do you have experience with, if you have a lousy program, uh, Matt, that you're working with, and you know it's not very effective, and you can see another one over here that's, how do you deal with that? What do you, what do, you do to get people to take information to heart and try to improve based on it? Let's start with Matt and then okay. we'll go to Sasha. And <laughs> yeah, those are really hard conversations to have. Really hard conversations to have. And we have them semi regularly with the leaders and the boards that are overseeing organizations to go in and say, you know, what you're doing is not working. Uh, your business model is not right. And, uh, you know, the outcomes, you're just, you're just not seeing them. And, and maybe you need to either find a partner to work with that will help you be able to do what you're doing better. Uh, so we end up doing quite a bit of merger work, helping organizations come together in creative and innovative ways. And frankly, we've helped organizations close up shop because they're just, they're just not able to, to get there. Those, I, th I say those are the minority. In, in most of the cases, the people that are running these, these interventions in these organizations are like uh, Carolyn, and they, uh, they want to do better, and they take that info. The, the biggest challenge is one, that you, I don't know if you directly addressed, but I know you and I have talked about it, is just sort of, okay, great, where's the money to, to do better? Mm -hmm. you know, how, do I, how do I get that investment, or how do, I, how do I get the richness of data that I probably need and don't have mm -hmm. that is very expensive? The funders aren't funding it, uh, and, and we can't raise it, and so there's really a question, it's not a question of desire, it's a question of, of how they get there. And I would tell you that, that probably 75% or more uh, just kind of keep plugging along. And they, they decide that good enough is good enough. Mm -hmm. And the, the data that we have uh, um, is, you know, is good enough and we've, and we've made a difference. Is that efficient? Is that the, uh, the most effective model for how we, how we address big problems? Probably not. Okay, Probably I want to come back to that, Sasha. Well, um, we're, it's hard. I, uh, I think within this context of trying to fund evidence-based programming, it cannot be understated that success is still measured by spending the money and serving clients as well. Like, and so primarily, as much as I want to, you know, I want to fund innovation and I want to fund evidence, I have to go back to the legislature every two years, and the last thing I want to do is lapse any of that money. And I've got this big competitive procurement process in the way which means that when I get the money, I've got this, the clock starts ticking. I'm gonna get the, develop the scope of work, get the RFP out, evaluate the proposals, get the contracts signed, get them starting to see clients. We're already, and then we're, you know, we're a year into, I've only got a year left before the legislature comes back in town and says, how's that going? So when you, you know, and you've got this idea of get, having some patience and allowing failure, and when do you, when do you call a success or a failure? You know, what, we don't have a, a, a logic model yet for what that looks like. Um, so, so um, and then there's this real world issue of if I have to re-procure that contract, I'm gonna just lie in front of a bus because it took <laughs> right. a year. Oh, to please, get, please don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it takes a year. This will be an example of a bad outcome for evidence-based <laughs> policy. <laughs> right. that, you know. Might be, yes, a, a permanent uh, solution of temporary problem. But, um, <laughs> but, but there is this like, can we just stick with this contract for a while? Just because re-procuring it and shifting the funding from here to there is such an enormous amount of work. And, um, and if we're not sure we really learned what wasn't working, and we still aren't any more sure what is working, I would need to have a really strong motivation. And that's not even accounting for all the local politics, because I have learned in just pulling out of a community can be a nightmare for about a decade. Depending on only a decade. Yeah. Well, I mean, I maybe I haven't been around long enough. <laughs> but yes, I mean, we are still. We even saw a budget writer this session that said you will go back and take some of your existing money and re-procure this old program in these exact counties where that lost funding back three years ago. So I mean, you have this like organizations and communities and the people who sit on their boards and golf with whomever who still will champion even after you've pulled out. So you have, within the context of all of that, I think 
really this promise of being able to use evidence is huge. There's, that's a much better reason to start a program or stop a program than all the other reasons that have been used for the last 30 years. But um, we're still, with all the qualifiers that you all have presented about really what is the quality of this evidence and what is the evidence and to, what, to whom does it apply and are you using it in the right way and then are you monitoring it in the right way um, is a huge issue. Tell us, the, evidently you did pull out of a place because you didn't think it was working? Well, I, it, it was a little, it preceded me, but yes, there was, um, I so, don't know But, but my was, question is what, what How did they know that? What, what was it based on? I'm not even sure if it was, it was more based on a forward look of what might work better. And so at the time, what, what the PEI division did when it put out a grant for a small amount of money was anyone in the state could apply for it and then the competitive process sort of might take geographic location or need, community need into account, but it was only one variable. And so um, there was this sense that uh, maybe this approach that was taken in the, the areas that lost the funding wasn't as successful, so um, let's try this new approach. One of the, one of, and one of the changes was we allowed them to use multiple models. Let's have them just use one model of programming. Um, and uh, for this was parent education in particular. So that was one idea, um, and just different people won those bids. And it wasn't as, I don't think it was as deliberate as one might be, like let's try, it was, we, 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 at that point we were allowing a menu of evidence-based programming to choose from, which is one way to go. Um, we've, we've gotten even less prescriptive more recently with just pr proposed an evidence-based um, model um, because we're trying to allow more community control. But then we, we realized, and this is very humbling, um, how do we tell if they're actually, we know how to, we, we know how to tell if it is an evidence-based model because we have the, all the clearinghouses. But how do we tell if they're really trained in model fidelity? Not every developer's different. Some give certificates, some are really involved in, in training and certifying and being on the ground and collecting data. Others are not. And others will sign a letter saying any augmentation or modification is perfectly fine with them. So then there's that other issue of, oh God, well, are we is it still evidence-based if we, if we let the, this contractor submit this, this letter of modification and go serve a different population for which there's no evidence, mm -hmm. um, but their, their community needs it for that group of people? Mm -hmm. you know, so to what extent, and my, my uh, group of staff, like we can't know, we're funding probably over 50 different models of parent education or home visiting or crisis counseling and um, we don't know all these developers and all their approaches and all of the, the levels at which they stay involved. Um, and, and so there's this, in a perfect world, I believe for our work, you would have a community organization that could offer an array of services for families, mm -hmm. and, and those families would get to choose what seemed best for them. Mm -hmm. Like maybe, I don't know that I want someone coming to my home. I'd rather actually go to a class and meet other people, or I'd actually just need a little bit of case management and finding my way to a lawyer and, and figuring out how to get health care or whatever. Um, but one of the limitations of evidence-based programming in my mind is we sort of force an organization to have a one-size-fits-all mm -hmm. model. Like, well, we, we paid 100 grand and we got trained in X, Y, Z, and so that's Absolutely. what you get. Yeah. And um, because that's what we do. Um, and that's what we were trained in and we're collecting all this data and we have this sort of purist approach as opposed to like, well, over here we have some people who do nurse family partnership, but we also have, um, you know, parenting wisely and then we have a class on the incredible years and here's how they're all kind of different what sounds good. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah, go ahead. I follow up on that? I mean, I just, I, I think you're onto something, uh, Sasha. When we look at some of I mean, the most complex, nasty, social problems that we're, we're addressing. I mean, it's sort of on the farthest end of the spectrum. You know, I put things like chronic homelessness, mm -hmm. foster care, I mean, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the systems in which the individuals whose lives we're trying to work are operating are so incredibly complex. There are so many players and actors and variables in their lives. I worry that uh, where evidence basis is strong is usually on sort of an intervention or something that's you know a little more narrowly targeted, yeah. but but that target you know if I if I look at a foster kid's life who spends in this community an average of 26 months in substitute care, mm -hmm. who has six different placements, mm -hmm. homes you know residential treatment centers, hospitals, whatever it might be, um, uh, and, and who's touched by you know. You know 
500 people in the system during their time in care, you, I could find an evidence-based, you know, a therapy, a trauma-informed therapy, mm -hmm. or a counseling, uh, something or other. But trying to evidence-base the system <laughs> that's, that's, that's trying to affect the life of that child is impossible. We're working with uh, an academic group out of TCU uh, called the Institute uh, for Child Development that's developed some of the most data-driven, scientific systems of interventions of caring for a child who's been traumatized, trauma-informed care. I mean, it, it's the pinnacle of, of trauma-informed care. We've been working with DFPS mm -hmm. and CPS for years trying to get it. Mm -hmm. They have struggled so hard to get any evidence basis designation. And they've got data, they've got, I mean, they know it works, but because <laughs> their model is, a, is about a system of care yeah. and not an intervention, yeah. you know, they, they took it to, to, to California, to the clearinghouse, and California said, we don't know what to do with this. Yeah. We have to come up with a whole new category and recruit a whole new panel of people mm -hmm. just to consider your application yeah. because it's a system of care. Yeah. And they're still wrangling in the weeds on that. So and the that, audience, I hope you can see why I'm always hesitant to talk to the practitioners. <laughs> <laughs> I can draw Bert, Bert, all kinds Bert of neat bubble. little charts and here's the way it's going to work and so forth. Yeah. And then these guys come in here and point out a hundred reasons why <laughs> it's not going to work. Gonna work. Uh, so we do, I mean, we've got to deal with these. So do you want to and, I mean, comment just, on just this one? By the way, a funding ends. I mean, there's a whole, you know, you could get a, we got a fantastic grant last year, but it, it ended in December. So what happens to those results? What happens to those people? Mm. I can say, come to our other classes, but it's not accessible to them. So there isn't this ongoing <clears throat> funding that trickles down to these smaller nonprofits. And again, you know, not, not woe is me, because obviously we're trying something different, but the funding for adult obesity is just not there. Mm. And so we could change around our entire mission and say, let's write a $100,000 grant for kids and obesity, but that's then chasing the dollars, and that's yeah. not what we Viva's about. Yeah. We're, we're about doing something a little different, so. Despite the fact that if we could really actually do something about obesity, we'd save money all over the all place. All over, exactly. Uh, and exactly. people live longer, they'd be happier right. all. So, so fund, you know, for us, as Matt kind of mentioned, it, it's an, funding is an issue, and with evaluation, right. not only to, to make the evaluation, um, which we have some pre and some some great pre and, and post surveys, mm -hmm. but who's going to implement it? And that mm -hmm. person to implement it, it's right now it's me and a part time program manager who's here, um, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And we have all of our instructors out in the fields, but to implement that those um, pre and post surveys, you know, to 19 locations a week is is daunting. Okay, before we go to the audience, I want to ask you one more question, follow, kind of a follow-up on, uh, on the issue about evaluation. And that is, I said that I, if, if, if the evidence-based movement is going to make a difference in the country as a whole, we're going to have to change the culture of program operation and program operators. So that's everything from they're going to have to realize how important evidence is, they're going to have to have a business plan, as Matt emphasized. Mm -hmm. They're going to have to figure out how they're going to collect their data. Mm -hmm. uh, this has to apply to state legislators, to federal legislators, to administrators. Everybody has to be roughly on the same page. Do you see this happening in Texas? No way. <laughs> <laughs> like, no way. Okay, so we're going to start with the positive, and then we're going to go to the negative. And I'm like, <laughs> no way. <laughs> no way. The will is there. I believe the will is definitely there, but you're right. I mean, I think you hinted at this earlier. Sometimes when I hear this question of, is this evidence based, and I want to see evidence if it's working, I hear the like, so that I can cut it if it isn't. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's not necessarily always about finding what's working and then right. expanding it. It's often about justifying getting rid of I figured it. Texas would be a good place to ask this question because you are suffused with Repu Republicans. <laughs> but, and they're the ones that ask that kind of question. But I do feel that, and that is true, but I do feel that they really would fund something if they felt confident it worked. Particularly when it comes to child abuse prevention, it is, you know, there's very strong bipartisan support around everything involved with CPS. There's a very strong will. Um, and, and, and certainly they want to see. Well, what about the program operators you work with? Do, are the, do you see evidence that they're, they see the logic of trying to focus on evidence and they would like to do a better job of that? They really would like to know if, if their program is working and they're willing to change and so forth? I think, I think there's still this very uh, hierarchical relationship that they're willing to do what they need to do to get the funding. And
And so, um, and, and you know, and there is, uh, when we went out to these community meetings for a program we started funding last year called HOPES, our Healthy Outcome Supervision and Early Support, and I know we have some of our contractors here, we went to the community first and said, we want to fund what you build. We want it to include evidence-based programming, but each county can come up with something different. We want to support families who have kids zero to five, because that's our most vulnerable population for child abuse and neglect, and you know, just, just bring us these amazing proposals. But the, at, and the meetings, there was, not, not in Travis County, um, <laughs> where there was this brain trust of, of amazing things, but lots of these other communities were just, I mean, they literally just said, well, what do you want us to do? Um, and so they're still sort of trained, just we'll write the RF, we'll write the proposal based on what you want. And, and so to that extent, yes, they're willing to, and they're willing to let evaluators come in, and they're willing to sort of take direction. Um, but I think there is still a lot of in, you know, community groups that are doing work that they believe is effective, and they're not interested in the investment it might take, and, and rightly so, in, um, um, in producing research, um, because they're able to get funding without that at the community level mm -hmm. through other, other mechanisms. So I think we're kind of ha half, half there and a half. No. What happens when you say to people like that, but how do you really know it works? I mean, I know you feel good about the program and you're proud of it and all that, but do you really, can you tell me that you can show me ways that you could tell a neutral party, like a, mm -hmm. a state legislator, that this is why this program works, we can show it. What happens when, think, you, when you confront people with an issue like that? I think that there's this sense that they now have to have more than success stories, um, um, like you, you mentioned, or the letters, the testimonials, although those can still be incredibly oh, yes. powerful in oh, the real world. Bet. And so they still do video testimonials and they still collect mm -hmm. stories. Um, but I, I think that there's this growing sense they have to have data. Um, and and, um, and and, and then you get into this issue of corruption, I think that, that which I think of more as like cherry picking or the problem of, of voluntary self, the self-selection bias, um, where you know it's easy then, or you get this, this hesitancy to serve the harder to serve populations because they will bring down your data. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and they're exactly the ones that we need to get to and they're the hardest to get to. Um, so there's a, both a financial dis disincentive to spend a lot of outreach efforts. Um, there is, I mean, you talk about Zumba, like we know there's things that would bring clients in like that in a tremendous way. That does, that sounds terrible downtown. When you, you hear this like, you're paying for Zumba classes, or you, you put in a basketball court, you know, you, what, you have accordion classes for young people, what right. the hell is that? Right. And right. 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 You know, taxpayer dollars. That's why we're not like, getting well, any funding. That's what them. this community yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, why is that a bad um, thing? But there's still this, <laughs> even if it works, this idea of you have to sell it, and there's still this, um, I, you know, you are in some ways selling, you know, like eating broccoli to a three-year-old. I mean, it is. Um, it's not or easy. a 33-year-old. Um, <laughs> yes. So let's go to both of you, yeah. but about a minute and a half sure. so we can have so plenty of time for the audience. There's, there's one thing that we're not, that we're sort of talking about, we're dancing around it, and this is why I shook my head no, that I'm pessimistic, that even if the politicians, and even if, our, our state sort of leadership um, embraced evidence-based uh, as, a, as, a, as a model. The, the operators are not going to do it, and here's why. Money. Mm -hmm. Money. We forget that the vast majority of the fuel that runs organizations that are doing social intervention, the, the, the dollars, you know, it's all about money in the end, right? Uh, if, if you don't have the money, you can't, you can't do your work. That the vast majority of money doesn't come from government. It doesn't even come from sort of uh, institutional philanthropy. It comes from you and me and the people in this room writing checks. 75%, last numbers I saw, 75% of the fuel that's fueling our social sector comes from individual donors. Really? Okay. And so it's not government. We think government dollars, government this, government that, and, and we sort of get, I think, hyped up to think, and forgive me, I'm not, yeah, it's not disparaging it, that the mm -hmm. government can affect the kind of change. But the money's just not there. The, 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 the sliver of, of the fuel that's running our sector from government, and I don't know the exact numbers, but it's, it's, a, tiny, it's a tiny number. And so when you think about it, who's able to enforce this evidence basis approach, it's mostly government. They have a small share. Maybe some of the larger institutional funders are getting savvy too and smart and they're actually funding and they're counting those things. 
but you know, much more than 50% of the fuel is not being controlled by, managed by, yanked back by uh, groups or individuals who think about or care about these issues. They're right. the ones who are gonna be influenced every year mm -hmm. by the story, by the video, by the report that probably has good data, but it may not be evidence-based right. data, right, right. Or scientific data. So I agree with everything you say, uh, but I wanna point out that we do have a number of huge institutions that we're all That's very right. interested in that are primarily supported by government, and government can make them dance its tune, like the schools. Right. And Carolyn. So this is partly why we have never been even you know, eligible to get government funding, is because we don't have those hard facts yet. That is something that obviously we want to do, and we want to get the data. But you know, there's there's such a, a it's like a catch twenty two. You need to grow to get the awareness and to get the funding, but you can't grow without the funding and without the evidence base. So if you get a, a check for twenty thousand dollars, you're I'm gonna we're gonna put it in programs. We're not we're probably not gonna put it so much into into evidence unless that specific funder or that government agency or that foundation wants us to, which would be fantastic, but for us to even apply for just a, an, evaluate, an evaluation grant is, is again, daunting. And there, mm -hmm. are, there are probably a lot of people who wanna do the evaluation, you know, the write-up and, and the pre and post-test, but then to in implement it is, is so much more expensive. Audience, so. raise your hand, tell us your name. Don't knock each other over, raise your <laughs> hand now. Down here in front? All the way down in front. So, Carolyn, I just wanted to, since you, uh, so Carolyn didn't mention this, but she came to me because I teach a class on program evaluation. She was one of the clients for our program evaluation class. And so part of that, the goal was to like work through that Yep. process of what you know mm -hmm. if you would do this evaluation would you do it or, so maybe right. you could just yep. speak a little so on what you took from we that we had and two students do. from your class come um, it was a little over a year ago maybe last spring or like uh, two falls ago yeah um, and so what they found was that they like like what I was saying they had this entire report for us which was helpful, but then what? Then how do we implement it? Then how do we get the funding to actually get someone to implement it? So they helped us with a couple of questions on our pre and post test. Um, they helped us with gathering some individual data from some particular participants at, at one location. But it's, it's like the, the follow up from that. Then, then where is the manpower to actually continue that? Because again, we don't have the funding to, to just continue just the evaluation portion when we have so many other you know, issues going on with our organization. I, I also remember one thing from the process in interacting with your organization was when you think about, uh, Cynthia, I was just saying, you know, wh what could we, what could you have as a measure? And well, what if you had people come in and you weighed them pre and post right. or you measured them, you know, with the calipers, or whatever. And I remember you made a very insightful point. Uh -huh. It was kind of interesting why you might resist right. what we might think as a measure that, you know, Health and Human right. Services would like. And that is because clients might have different feel about mm -hmm. coming in for those classes then. Oh, right. I'm gonna be monitored. Or I know I had a bad week. <laughs> I right. ate right. far more tamales than I should right. have and I don't wanna get on the scale so I'm not gonna go to class. So That's that was exactly really insightful yep. for and me to think about because yep. we think why not a more rigorous measure. Mm -hmm. and there was a real practical thing like Ron mentioned, just getting participation up. That's really great. Yeah. Right. We might have disincentivized that by putting scales or yeah. you know, doing they don't like wanna, that. No one wants to get weight. You don't want to get weight if you're just going to your 24 hour class. And so, right. you know, it's just, it's, it's not a fun thing. So we're trying, you know, so much of We Viva is just creating a fun atmosphere around fitness and nutrition and getting you exposed to something that maybe you thought was not fun or maybe you thought was too hard or culturally not relevant to you. And then once you get into our classes and you see everyone looks like you and everyone speaks Spanish and it's fun and we don't care how much you weigh or how much you lost or anything. We care, you know, what your race is, what your ethnicity and what your race is and where, what zip code do you live in? Because we wanna know, are you traveling that far to get to our classes because they're free? Because they're culturally appropriate? Like what, what's going on there? So we don't ask any other questions about BMI or, or weight. Yeah, I think that this just raises such an important issue that I've seen working with lots of different um, community organizations 
that they really, you know, they are going to measure the things that they feel are important for their program and their organization. And if, if somehow we can build more of a culture of, of having those outcomes also be uh, measurable and um, something that we can kind of uh, build an evidence base around, I think mm -hmm. that, that we, there's room for kind of growth there because you Absolutely. are measuring a lot of things. And um, we can find some out outcomes because every community organization wants to know that it's doing something. Right. You don't just keep going because right. you don't feel like you are. But my, my question, uh, just a little bit switching fields, is more about fidelity and model fidelity. And, and um, I, I really do want to know who is responsible for mm -hmm. model fidelity. Um, is it the program models that have developed mm -hmm. these and do the training? Um, are they looking at their data? We find that mm -hmm. some are and some are less. Um, is it the program operators who are getting funding to implement this? Mm -hmm. Because we find that some programs, that's what's being offered, like Sasha said, that's the program I'm implementing. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, I, I really, I'm not trying to minimize uh, uh, them at all, but that, uh, who is responsible for model fidelity? Mm -hmm. You probably have. Well, I mean, I'll just speak to my colleagues who are running the home visiting program that, that I know Cynthia is working closely with, um, you know, they've taken that on in, in terms of building an infrastructure and really becoming that mediator between the federal and state funders and then the program implementers. And they do a lot, both in training and support and also the monitoring of model fidelity. But it's, it means, one, they've invested a lot of resources in staff at that state agency level and, um, and they've narrowed the choice of home visiting models in order to be able to do that, in order to have a strong infrastructure that does you know, check on the training of the practitioners and the dosage and frequency, I mean, the actual application of, of the evidence-based model. Is it being delivered um, according to model fidelity? Uh, in PEI, we're a little, since uh, we're funding everything from crisis counseling to parent education programs, fatherhood programs, some home visiting, but we also do a lot of positive youth development, and our, our base is so much broader, we really do very little. I mean, it's really part of the initial application to get funding. You show some sort of proof. We have an evidence-based ranking tool. Um, we try to know as much as we can about what we should see in terms of documentation based on the developer's model. Um, and then after that, it's re we're just looking for results. And I mean, even then, that's a little, we do a pre and post, and we, we track to make sure that the parents don't end up in the child welfare system or the youth don't end up in the juvenile delinquency system. That's, um, and, uh, and then we make sure folks are, you know, folks are being seen and served, but we don't, we don't make sure, and I mean, because there's so many, you know, that if, you know, 12 sessions of a class are what is model fidelity that they, that the parents actually completed. I mean, I think we do, we do try to track some kind of service completion, but it's different for every model and we're funding so many of them. So we, uh, I would say, you know, we sort of, skim and do our best, but I've, I've wondered that too. Like, well, if that's our job, we, we don't have the staff to do it. Matt, do you, are some of the programs that you work with at 6,000, right? Say again. 6,000. 6, well, there's 6, there's 6 yeah. uh, profit. Are some doing. of them using model programs trying to do, you know, Absolutely. nurse family partnership or whatever? Absolutely, yeah. Well, we're, we're NFP's coming to town, mm -hmm. uh, and we've got other, other home visiting models, uh, do a lot of work in foster care, and I, you know, I think um, the organizations that are trying to implement evidence-based practices, I think, are, are I, would, I would give it sort of, a, to answer your question, sort of a A prime and an A responsibility. I think the organization itself is ultimately responsible for ensuring the fidelity. But I'll tell you that it's hard. I mean, it is, it is really hard. It's costly uh, working with an organization that's implementing a model now. And I mean, they're losing staff left and right because the staff just can't cut it or don't believe in it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it, this, is, this, this implementation of this model is it's just transforming their whole, their whole operation. I mean, yeah. It's very costly. Yeah. And, but, but, you know, but, but I think that responsibility is shared with the, the, the developer, the, you know, because yeah. if you don't do, if you, if you don't set the model up right, if you don't do the training effectively, if you're not measuring, and, and then really providing, what I, what I struggle with most is that a lot of sort of you know, more of the kind of fly-by-night Groups will come in and do the eight-hour training, or the and, and, mm -hmm. and sort of they're gone, and you get your certificate, and mm -hmm. good luck with that. The one that I mentioned earlier that we're working with out of TCU, I mean, it's 40 hours of prep work before the training, 40 hours of training, 
and then to kind of get the actual certification in it. I mean, there's another 40 to 80 hours of support. And then on top of that, they're doing a year's worth of once a month coaching and, and other sessions that, you know, kind of eight hours a, a month. And so, you know, they're taking a huge amount of the onus to ensure fidelity because they know that the one of these so One of these organizations you work with, the, it's doing all that that you just described? Absolutely. Actually, yeah. several, wow. several are doing that. Several are doing that, in part because they, they believe in it so much mm -hmm. and they know it's going to transform how they care for, for mm -hmm. kids that have been, been traumatized. But it's, so I, I, think it's, I think it's their primary responsibility, but it's yeah. shared. Yeah. Another big question about uh, fidelity is that in United, the United States is so huge and so many different kinds of communities, so many different ethnic groups, so many different everything, that there's no such thing. I, I guarantee it. There's no such thing as a program that you could do it exactly the same way all over the country. You're going to have to adapt. So the question of fidelity, the word fidelity itself is a little misleading because the, the implication is you've got to do it exactly. So we, that's something we have to learn to deal with. What are the really crucial parts of the program that have to be implemented? You may have to change it in some way, but you've got to have this piece of it and so forth. So there are a lot of big questions here uh, other than who's responsible. Another question from the audience. Everybody's hungry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there's one back there. This is going to be the last one, so make it quick and we're going to have a quick answer. <laughs> Just a snarky comment. <laughs> if if uh, implementing the program itself is difficult, then there's something wrong with the program. I, I didn't hear the comment. Uh, if many. If, Snarky if, comments if it, if, are great when you can't hear them, you know. Sorry. Yeah, real loud. If implementing the model with fidelity is so difficult, then it seems there's probably something with the model. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Seems like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think mean, everybody agrees with that. Yeah. And I think it takes time. I think that um, mm -hmm. that was one of the things that uh, Ron, you had mentioned early on, you know, we, we don't want the um, folks in the, at the federal level to say this didn't work mm -hmm. um, and then let's stop doing it. We want to say this isn't working yet and we need to learn uh, because it really is taking our community's time to learn how to do this, to get trained, to get comfortable with it. Um, and so the 2016 results might not look as strong as we want them to, but the 2020 results, if they were reviewed, might look a lot stronger. And so um, I think that you know this uh, discussion today has just been really helpful for me to, to think through these issues more broadly and to be excited about a new culture of it, but to also just figure out that we, ha we're, we have to enter into this um, you know, with our eyes wide open and, and learn from it as we go um, so that we do this right. And, um, Please join me in thanking our panel. Who, uh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>